you know, the state of Texas, football is religion. Let's be honest about that. Being a Westlake football player was a tremendous honor, and with that came tremendous responsibility. You grow up wanting to play for Westlake as a kid. You go to middle school, you're running the basics of the Westlake offense. And then you get your chance when you get to be a freshman. Coach Schrader was a legend already. So when we came and, and played for him, it was, uh, it was a big deal. And you know, once you're, once you're there and you're like, all right, I'm gonna be that next guy. I'm gonna be the guy who's gonna take Westlake to their first state champion. And that was kind of the, the way it was going for myself. Uh, until I had a, uh, blew my knee out my sophomore year. And uh, from that, uh, I lost my spot to a guy named Drew Brees. And, uh, you know, I never got that spot back. I was born in Dallas, Texas. I moved to Austin when I was seven years old. And that was right at a time where my parents, parents were getting divorced. And so, you know, we lived in a lot of different places from age seven to 14. We lived in central Austin, north Austin, closer to south Austin. But at the end of the day, my mom had done a ton of research on all the high schools um, in Austin and felt like Westlake High School had the best all around academics and athletics. And she wanted that opportunity for, you know, me and my brother. And so she moved into the Westlake High School district so that we would be able to go to high school there. You know, I moved to Westlake in eighth grade, and so I was a bit late as well. I mean, Drew was too. Drew went to a private school and then kind of moved over for high school. And so I think um, we were a little bit later to the scene there. Playing for Westlake was tough. You know, we had two days, we grew up together. Drew came aboard though in ninth grade. I'd known Drew since we were nine years old, though. We went to church together at First Baptist. So I knew Drew a little bit before he came aboard at Westlake. Playing at Westlake was, he was at the top of the top, the cream of the crop. There's really a Drew Brees story. As far as us, uh, we really didn't know anything about Drew Brees because he didn't go to the middle school at, at the Westlake District School District. And uh, when he came in as a freshman, his dad tells us the first scrimmage we had when he was a freshman, he didn't get in the scrimmage. <laughs> Chip, his dad, said he, he thought about talking to me about it, but he didn't. And so anyway, that first year, Drew played on our freshman B team. Then the, the next year, he was going to play on our JVB team, and the starting quarterback in that class got hurt. And I have this story about one of my assistant coaches, when the starting quarterback got hurt, he said, what are we going to do? This is going to be the weakest JV we've had in years. And I said, well, you know, who's the next guy up? And he said, well, you know, Drew Brees is on the B team. And, and I said, well, bring up Drew Brees. As much as, you know, I wanted to be that guy, you know, Drew's a very good friend of mine. And I want him to be successful. And he stepped in and watching him take the reins, whoo. A little scary. He had an aptitude to play quarterback. And we didn't pick it up until all these circumstances happened where we had to play him at quarterback. Because Johnny got hurt and where was our next option? Take him off the, who's the, who's the next quarterback? Coach said, well, I had Drew Brees is down on the JBB team. I said, well, you gotta play him. And then it turns out he just started establishing himself. You know, the leadership, the aptitude, the decision making that does not show up at a football camp. It shows up in the middle of a game. Probably 1994, I was a young coach in the Dallas area. My father-in-law, Evie Neptune, who was the athletic director here at Austin Westlake at the time, and, and now the stadium is named after him here. We were at the uh, Astrodome in Houston, came in to watch Westlake play John Tyler in the state championship game. Uh, I was on the sideline, looked down in the end zone, this young quarterback throwing the football around, and uh, he was wearing number 15. And I asked my father-in-law, I said, uh, who's that? He goes, well, what a beautiful throwing motion, you know, and that always catches my eye. And he goes, his name's Drew Brees. He was our JV quarterback this year, uh, but we got a lot of high hopes for him, probably be the starter next year. And lo and behold, Drew was the starter for Westlake in 95. I took him all the way, I think, to the third or fourth round. And he, he had a knee injury 
during that playoff run, and they got kind of got that cut short. So I tore my ACL my junior year, the third round of the playoffs. I remember it like it was yesterday. We were undefeated. It was probably one of the best teams I've ever been a part of. We were going down to play in the third round of the playoffs, a team called Alice down in South Texas. It was a hostile environment, you know, just one of these kind of gritty games that we're involved in, tough physical. And, you know, up until that point, really, as it pertained to any sport, I had never really suffered any type of a serious injury. You know, certainly nothing that caused me to miss any games or even miss a, a single play. And so I remember it was, it was a bootleg play, so I fake a handoff and I, and I go to my, my right and I get hit and I come down and I, I feel my knee just, you know, it was kind of like slipped out of place and came back. And I immediately knew that something wasn't right, especially as I began, you know, walked to the sideline and it was very unstable. And so when the doctor did the test and looked at me and said, you've torn your ACL, I mean, I was just completely devastated, just devastated. You know, not only just kind of the hopes and dreams of that season and, you know, that team feeling like, you know, we had an opportunity to state championship, but I had seen friends and other teammates have ACL injuries just like this, and some had never come back the same. You know, it just, for whatever reason, you know, it's a serious injury. And so for me, I thought, man, my football career is over. It was gut-wrenching when it happened because you just feel, it, at that point, it wasn't clear that he was gonna have a very successful collegiate career or scholarship, certainly not pros. I mean, as I'm sure it's well-documented, his kind of lack of attention to him in high school. Um, and so when you take, when you have an injury like that and it's gonna shelve you for a year, I mean, if said another way, that's gonna shelve you for 50% of your career. If you're a junior and that happens and you miss your senior year, I mean, that that's, the end of your sport, effectively. It's not a sprained ankle. And so you're just gutted when it happens. I remember the look on his face, um, how badly he wanted to be on the field. Drew is probably the most competitive person I have ever met. It's a quiet competitiveness, though. Quiet, um, but doggedly determinative. I mean, he is going to beat you. He is gonna be the best at whatever he does. Drew is the most competitive person you've ever met. And for somebody to tell him he couldn't do something and challenge him, uh, that's about the worst thing you can do is challenge Drew Brees. Because he will step up to the challenge and nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, he'll meet it. It was a defining moment for me in my athletic career. Because up until that point, I, I hadn't really faced that type of adversity before. You know, uh, 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 the type of adversity where you feel like something's really being taken away from you, you know, and that maybe you won't come back the same, you know. Um, and it scared me, it motivated me, it, it inspired me, it, it made me much stronger in my faith. Um, I really became a Christian at that time in my life. He's not gonna brag about it. But I've always felt like he's real strong in his faith. And, and you know, we were talking in our Bible class, we all look back at our lives. Coaches, uh, we're all kind of retired, and we can see where things happen in our life that uh, we feel like God has something to do with it. And I've always felt that about true. I never talked to him about it, but I always felt that way. You know, you look back at your life, and you know, why did, why did he tear his ACL? Would he be in the New Orleans Saints or the leading passer without tearing at ACL? Or why didn't he play in that first scrimmage when he was a freshman? Was it something that humbled him, that put him, you know, made him work harder? I realized that maybe the things that I was worrying about were really very trivial. You know, it was really about, you know, what is my, what's more of my purpose, you know, and, and so, I think I just learned a lot about myself during that time and certainly my faith being strengthened and just took it one day at a time and it was amazing, I think, the transformation, not only physically but mentally, psychologically, um, that I went through over the next six months as I went through the rehab process and just, you know, I gained 25 pounds. I became so much mentally tougher. You know, I had to overcome obstacles in rehab that I'd never had to overcome before. And, you know, there's a toughness element, both mentally and physically, that comes along with that. And, you know, by the time the next season rolled around, I was bigger, stronger, faster, but I was also so much mentally tougher and, and, and felt like not only was I gonna come back, but I was gonna come back stronger. You know, that was my mentality during that whole process. Redemption is a beautiful thing. 
and you have to be willing to do the work. And I think some people might crawl in a hole one way and never come out and feel sorry and oh me, and then certain other folks are invigorated by it. You see it, I think, even today with professional athletes. Some are never the same. Some you look at just the, watching them train and rehab from an injury is as inspiring as anything they'll ever do on a field. And that doesn't get as much press. And certainly in high school, you're not watching Drew rehab, but he busted his ass. And he busted his ass so he could get fully back, wanted his position back, wanted to lead the team. I know he had bigger ideas on what he could do after that, but it takes a lot of work. And it's hard to do that when you're not at 100%, when your leg feels like it weighs 100 pounds and you can't bend your knee. And, and the light at the end of the tunnel isn't two weeks on a sprained ankle, but it's it's nine months and then even then you're uncertain when you plant on it if it's going to go again so every time you take a step from there the rest of your life you're potentially looking at a nine month hiatus and i think it takes a special mind share to kind of you got to compartmentalize it i think you see that in his leadership style i think he's not just like an empathetic figure, but he understands. So everybody, and certainly at the, at the professional level, everybody's hurt all the time, aside from maybe the first week of the season. I mean, everybody's banged up. And so I think having folks who have been through other traumatic type events like that just garners a lot of kind of respect and empathy and kind of understanding of what other people are going into. And I think he, today even, you know, between that and obviously the shoulder surgery where it looked like he was gonna be damaged goods forever. And people were telling him that, right? And you do that to somebody else of less kind of mental fortitude and they, pro they, they might shut down, right? You hear something enough, you begin to believe it. It's just psychographically, that's how things tend to happen. You do that to somebody like Drew and it's gonna be a big, that's a chip. That's a huge chip on the shoulder and it's gonna be an, I'm gonna show you. So he's clear to play football in August before his senior year. And uh, we were really concerned about it because of that knee injury. And but he, that's when I saw him start to develop. We were playing in the San Antonio Churchill. We were playing the Alamo Dome in uh, one of our playoff games. And Drew had steadily improved. And we were making our receiver breaks at like 10 or 12 yards. And so we moved him up to 20, where they'd make their breaks. And he was whistling that ball out there. And it was at that point. I remember one day in practice. When we make that change to make the cuts at a deeper distance, I mean, he was just exploding the ball, 30, 40, 50 yards down the field. And that, you know, to answer your question about what I, I thought, that maybe Drew really had some next level talent. But, you know, because at that point, no one was really recruiting him that much. He wasn't that big. He wasn't that fast. He wasn't that strong. But it took a while to, to discover those intangibles that he had. So, you know, it was that point, I, I just saw him develop. You know, the tone was set in the off season. I mean, as soon as, you know, we got into off season and, and the senior leadership stepped up and said, guys, this is, you know, this is how it's gonna be. You know, there's not gonna be a lot of, you know, people going and doing their own thing. We're gonna be one cohesive unit. It was amazing, it was a magical season. And Drew was, kind of the glue that kept everything together for us. He was a quarterback, he was our leader, he was tremendous and as we come to find out, he was a little underrated and he has used that throughout the consistency of his life to just prove the doubters wrong and he can continue to do that to, to this day. Um, we had a good regular season, but the regular season at that time wasn't that hard for Westlake to go through undefeated. It had done that a lot, and so that, nece that wasn't necessarily a precursor to a state championship. Um, that was kind of the expected, um, you know, never lose a regular season game, and then you get into the playoffs and anything, you know, really can happen. You know, the first playoff game was a little tough. We played San Antonio MacArthur. Uh, that was the closest game I think we played the entire year. And I think it was first game, playoff jitters. Uh, you know, once we got through that, we started to roll and uh, you know, Drew's shoulder caught fire. Our, you know, everybody was, was in sync. And before you know it, uh, we're in Dallas getting ready to play the state championship. It was, I mean, it was, it was really magical all the way to the state championship game where, you know, we're playing Abilene Cooper. Dominic Rhodes is the running back on the other side. He played in the NFL for a long time. The score was tied seven to seven at halftime. It was just one of these kind of gritty, tough games. And then, you know, we, we blew it open in the second half, got some turnovers, did some good things offensively and special teams and ended up winning 55 to 15, you know? So kind of went, won it running away, but 
just the, the journey. I mean, so much of that was just the journey. And again, I can reference every game and every guy on that team, just because that's, you know, for many people, that's, that's, that's kind of the end of it. You know, after high school, you know, not, not a lot of guys get the chance to go on and play beyond that. And so I think all of us had that mentality, like this was, you know, this was the pinnacle. Every season you could write a book. I mean, there's so many, you know, got discipline problems you deal with, you got just, you name it, you have to deal with it. I can remember we were playing in the Alamo Dome. We had like three more games before the state championship. And Johnny Rogers was a part of this. After we won the game, the team was together and Rogers had organized them and they were chanting, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees. I mean that that was that was sort of an unbelievable deal, and you know when you when you saw that happening, and Drew didn't really do anything extraordinary for this to happen. I think that's the story of Drew Brees. This humility, his just being Drew Brees creates team unity, and this whole team is in there chanting Drew Brees, and you don't chant the guy's name if you don't like him if they're ugly to you in the dressing room or whatever, or they bully you, you don't chant their name. And they were chanting his name, and that, that was just, that gave me the goosebumps when I heard that. Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees. Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees.